I'm really proud to be able to introduce Daniel Fagerman uh, from LiDAR USA. Uh, Daniel is a graduate of Purdue University. He's got a master's from the School of Civil Engineering. Um, is an EIT in Alabama. Um, in 2011, he joined his father's company, LiDAR USA, and he is a licensed 107, which is a, a, a UAV pilot. Um, um, in his presentation, Daniel's presentation today, he's going to be sharing a little bit about what his company has been doing in Mexico specifically with some of the Mayan ruins. I'm not sure if he's going to be referring to any of the other work that he's doing, but it genuinely, it brings LiDAR into a more human uh, kind of understandable uh, perspective. Uh, as I said, this has been featured prominently um, through the media. You may actually have seen it on, a, on one of the TV shows. I think Daniel will be referring to that. So, Dan, Daniel, are you hearing me today? Uh, let me make sure that we are connected. Are you there, Daniel? Yep. Can you hear Perfect. me? Excellent. Let's go ahead and we'll give you the screen and we're looking forward to your presentation. All right. So my original title of this presentation was more focused on the Uxmal uh, Mayan ruins in Mexico. Um, but we've done a lot of uh, a lot of different TV shows with a lot of different uh, with an archaeological bent to this that I will just briefly cover. But they're they're actually quite interesting. So I didn't want to throw those out. Um, so we also did another Mayan pyramid one that uh, went a lot more uh, was a lot bigger on television uh, than the, the Uxmal was more of a uh, uh, review and publication type. Cut, cut kind of thing that we did. So I'm just going to, there's like five or six different uh, projects we did here. We've done a lot more than that, but I just wanted to pick some of the more interesting ones that keep people awake in the presentation. <laughs> so uh, let me just skip through this. Let's see. Uh, this is the next slide. There we go. So just tell us, tell you about ourselves. Lighter USA is actually Fagerman Technology. It started back in 1999. Um, during that time, I was a uh, junior high, high school, and uh, 2011, I graduated from Purdue with my master's that was already stated, and um, we started LiDAR USA. Uh, we got this crazy idea about mobile LiDAR and just thought we would build our own unit. We started using our own unit, and then we had lots of increased people wanting to buy the units, and back in that time, the units were really big, expensive. And we had built one that was probably, was in today's terms, is still huge, but uh, it was a lot less expensive and had a lot of interest. So we then had to learn how to manufacture and, and develop an actual customer product that somebody else could use and not like a science experiment. So we've now evolved into, uh, so it's a, we're a father-son team, and now we're up to like 15, 20 employees scattered about in the U.S. and across the world. Um, Next slide. So I just want to go over the different products. It's not really, I'm, I'm not trying to make a sales pitch here. I just want to show you the different tools we have because we have to make a decision when we get contacted by these uh, TV shows or these archaeological sites, what is the best laser scanner to use to capture the data that they're after? It depends a lot on the environment, uh, if the scanner can handle it, and also like what kind of tree foliage there is. Uh, is it a lot of steep terrain? um that kind of thing so so right here what we have is a scanner that uh a lot of you guys are probably familiar if you, if you do any lidar of the veldine scanners this one is a 16 channel lidar uh has a range uh when you're flying with a drone we usually don't want to fly over 50 60 meters from the ground um accuracy is around four centimeters so typically with archaeological projects you're not really so interested in the, the high accuracy, like you're not doing pavement type scanning, but you want to be able to like discern if there's a one foot, uh, say, foundation that you're looking deep in the woods. Uh, you want to be able to see that. Um, a four centimeter scanner is just fine for that. Then you have the big brother, brother to the, the, what you just saw, this was gotten 32 channels, so it penetrates through the woods uh, or foliage a lot better because it has 32 uh, scan lines has a little bit longer range. You can fly between 50, 70 meters with this guy. Um, and you can capture uh, a lot of data very quickly. This one's capturing about 700,000 points a second. Typically you can fly and cover an area in about 15 minutes. You can cover about a 40 to 60 acre flight, depending on how fast you're wanting to fly and how many cross uh, hatches you do with your flight lines. Now this scanner has been around for about two years, but just now getting to where it's actually commercially uh, available to use on a, a mobile LiDAR unit. 
Um, so this one right here has eight channels, so fewer than what of the Veldines, but it has much longer range. So if you're in, uh, it's about an 80 meter flight, 80 to 100 meter flight height. Um, so if you're in like steep terrain, like some of these archaeological sites are, this one makes the drone pilot feel a lot more at ease when they're flying around. They're not just skimping across the tops of the trees um, and worried about flying into a, a cliff face or something like that. So they can fly much higher. This scanner is about a four centimeter, three to four centimeter scanner. And then you got some of the longer range scanners. So this one's a Regal scanner. It's a single line, but it has multiple returns. So uh, the other scanners also have multiple returns, but this one is a little bit more higher power. So the range on this scanner would be about 330 meters. And it's also a little bit more accurate. So you're looking around in the 15 millimeter to 20 millimeter range. Um, and it ha definitely has its place. So if you needed to mount on say a helicopter and fly it, uh, 100 meters to 200 meters high, you could definitely do that with this scanner. Uh, it collects about 100,000 points a second um, and can feel, you can you can fly 100, uh, 150 acres in one flight with this thing on a drone in about 15 minutes because the swath widths are so wide. Um, here's here's the biggest brother of all the Veldine scanners. This one's actually 128 lasers and you can it's got a range of about 200 to 250 meters. Uh, for archaeology, this one is great if you're trying to cover in the deep woods. Uh, you can see you get a lot more points on the ground. So with the, these archaeological sites, they're they're hidden. Like I didn't realize how hidden they were until you actually go down there and and see it for yourself. Um, you 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 just can't imagine how. Uh, my my perspective was how could there actually be things hidden down in the jungle? Well, when you go down there and you see there's it's nothing but trees and uh, leaves on the forest. Uh, floor and you can be standing right on top of a small pyramid or uh, a small building foundation from 2000 years ago and have no idea that you're there so getting a lot of points on the ground is really what it's, it's not really so much the accuracy as it is getting more points on the ground denser points to actually uh, for like a tool like global mapper to classify and see these these uh, man-made structures um, so we'll cover that. And then the biggest, the big, nicest scanner that we probably have is is the Regal Vuck scanner, and you can mount this on a helicopter or a drone and fly. It depending on settings and things, you can fly up to about 800 meters, um, and you can cover massive areas very quickly with this scanner. Um, so we'll go on with that one. So I wanted to cover the first one. I'm going to lead up to the Uxmal, but the first one I wanted to show you was, uh, if, if, if you guys are familiar with Jacques Cousteau, uh, Philippe Cousteau is his grandson, and uh, him and his wife are doing uh, a pirate Caribbean treasure type hunting show, and uh, they actually contacted us to come down and look for uh, a Spanish ship that uh, supposedly was actually was just recently found in the last year or two when during a drought the the creek had dried up some or the river small small river creek it's right in between there it had dried up some and some of these guys were actually looking for treasure waiting around and the guy stumped over a log what he thought it was a log and actually ended up being an old Spanish ship and there was already a legend about in that area that a Spanish ship had abandoned their uh, treasure somewhere in that area within a half a mile where that ship had wrecked, but they never actually had proof that there was anything there, that the ship was there or anything. So uh, when this came about, that's when this, this show was, was like, oh, man, this is an excellent opportunity to uh, uh, use LIDAR to look and see if they could find like a mound or a pit or something that looked like uh, – a burial site where they could have buried treasure, especially after they found this uh, this sunken ship. Um, so you can see this is right in the right by north of Pensacola, Florida, and actually it was about a five-hour drive from where we're based. We're based out of Huntsville, Alabama. Um, go to the next slide. So here's a picture of the host. Uh, in the middle is Philippe Cousteau, and then I'm on the left. And uh, whoever, if you've ever talked to Lighter USA, you've probably talked to Forrest. He's He's like our uh, liaison and our sales guy, um, but he's definitely more than that as well. But um, so we have Philippe in the middle there for this project. The uh, we selected the mini bucks because the leaves were off, uh, no no leaves on the tree at the time. You can see in the background, 
it's uh, kind of a swampy area on the other side of this boat launch that we had here. Uh, the ship was actually found within about half a mile of this, this boat dock. And so I ended up flying the drone. Let's see if I got another picture here. Here's what the LIDAR looks like. So the boat dock is on the far left corner, upper left corner. And I flew over to the right, which is about a mile uh, to a mile and a half away. And where we're looking at for the site where they thought maybe the ship had buried their treasure or the pirates or had buried the treasure was uh, over on the, uh, in that curve over there on the right side. So I uh, flew the drone over from the boat launch over there and collected data all the way over to the side. And this is about a 15 minute flight and I probably covered about a hundred acres at that time. Um, so the big thing about these TV shows, when you do these TV shows, you, when you, collect this LIDAR data, the moment the drone lands, they're already asking you, what's the data look like? What's the data look like? And if anybody has any experience with LIDAR, they know it doesn't just like come out on the USB stick and there it is for you to view and, and look at the data. So the best tool I found for getting something within an hour or two after, after landing, because these guys are in a hurry, they got, you got camera crew all around you, they're, uh, they're, they're filming every step that you make and they don't have much time to waste. The hosts are there and if the higher the profile of the host, the more impatient they are. Um, these guys actually were, were not that way, but uh, we see we, we collected this data and made something for them to have on TV to for maybe to go scout out within about two hours time. And we used uh, Global Mapper and auto classification tool. This project was probably collected about a year and a half, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we did all that in about uh, two hours. Um, there was probably uh, probably a couple billion points here to look at. Um, let's see if I got the next slide here. So, yeah, here we go. So you can see how wooded this area is. We use the auto classification tool to strip away these trees so we can see what lies underneath them. Now, this is all very swampy type area. Uh, you can't really walk out there. It's got standing water and uh and I wouldn't want to walk around out there. So, and it's an actual much bigger area than as it appears here. So, uh, let me move this slide here so I can see what I'm doing here. So, we were looking back, I was switching back and forth here, uh, and this little between classified and unclassified, ripping away the trees. And let's see if I can get a cursor. I saw somebody do that. Let's see, drawing tools. You can do a spotlight. Okay, so some of the areas that we thought might have been uh, a, a buried treasure was probably somewhere along here and along over here. But if you look real close, you can actually see this is probably a few hundred years ago. This waterway has definitely moved <laughs> over time. The morphology of the of the uh, of the river has has changed a lot. So go to the next slide here. Um, and that's what one thing I tried to explain to them. So they're, they're trying to be as excited as possible when we look at this data. So I, I produced this thing in like an hour and a half, and then I had to analyze it looking for any weird man-made things. So over here on the left was actually, these are boardwalks that somebody put out here to walk out to the, ed, the water's edge. And then somebody a long time ago dug this pond, and you can see where they pushed the, the, the dirt over here to the left. Well, the archaeologist and the host, they immediately saw this mound and then they saw the uh, the mounds over here and then like these little divots over here as like, oh, those are definitely sites that we're going to go look at. So uh, this, I told them, is probably likely from the excavation of this pond, but they, you know, they, they're trying to create a TV show here. So <laughs> they don't, they wanted me to kind of like remove stuff from this pond area here, um, but this this possibly could have been something. I didn't actually go and follow. I, they usually use me to collect the data and then they abandon me and go off to look at the site where I maybe highlighted a couple of areas. So in this particular, I don't know if this, this episode hasn't aired yet. Sometimes it takes up to two years for these shows to air. Um, I don't know if they actually found anything, but they, they went out and searched these two areas. And I think these two areas over here, maybe did some excavating just to to uh, look for Spanish treasure. I didn't see anything in the news, so I doubt they found anything, but it's very interesting. Um, for this next one, I actually have a co-star here. She went on this next trip 
uh, I sent her to this beautiful place in Cyprus to, uh, uh, we got a call from the History Channel on doing some Knights of the Templar uh, in the Holy Grail. So I'm gonna let her talk on this just for a couple minutes, only two or three slides. She can tell you about the experience and what they were after and a little bit of information about the site. Um, here we go, Rachel, go ahead. Okay. So, um, hi guys. Um, I, yeah, so we were in Cyprus and we were uh, on the show, or we weren't on the show, but we were uh, with the guys from the show, Buried, um, and they were basically looking for, um, actually they were going all the way from Paris to, they ended up in Jerusalem, to look at all the secret society almost of the Knights um, at the time. And the show Buried is based off of that is underground places that they have built like tunnels and different things um, to uh, basically hide off of the secret society, secret holy grail, basically to hide all these things. So um, that's where the show was. OK, so this is us um, in Cyprus and we were using the 32 uh, laser scanner. And we flew over this um, different sites, different buildings um, that were basically from, I think it was 1300 BC um, that apparently was completely underwater. I think that's in the next slide. Yeah, it was so it was completely underwater um, for many years. And then uh, they built a dam uh, right about. So this is the power company. And they built this dam so that it blocked off the water. Um, and now you can actually see the buildings that were all underwater at the time. But they think that uh, basically the Knights resided there during um, their crusades and at different time periods. Um, and so that was basically their secret society. And um, the next slide, this is the LIDAR data that we captured. And they use this actually in the show Buried, and that has aired. Um, but yeah. All right. So that was just a. She gets to go on all the cool places. Usually with these archaeological sites, uh, they're very, very rugged. No electricity, no internet, no cell phone. But she got to go to Cyprus and enjoy. They have some beautiful beaches there. Uh, all right. So the next one was a very interesting one that was very last minute as well. Uh, a little bit more rugged than what you saw in Cyprus down in uh, Peru at Lema Bamba. Uh, I didn't actually attend at this one. I was the guy back at the office that when they, as soon as they got internet, they broadcast the data back to me and I processed it through Global Mapper. Um, this one was uh, the Project Z is the name of the show, and uh, they were looking for the Amazon City of the Giants. So let's see. This one's down in Peru, uh, at Lima Bamba down there, um, just south of Ecuador. A very mountainous area uh, and very wooded, very jungle-like. Um, here's a picture of the host and then the two, two buddies that uh, went down there and pretended to be the experts on the site with the LIDAR. So they, these are the two pilots that collected the data. Um, here's a shot where they, they actually had to ride on donkeys and uh, horses to get to the, to, the, to the area that they were gonna scan. So it's actually quite open right here in the images you see, but where they actually went to, they had to hike up, up over a mountain about 900 feet and then over to the other side to, to map this area that, uh, they actually had livestock walking around and there was actually human remains in the area, but in there, that, in that area, nobody messes with the human remains. It's kind of a sacred thing. Um, you see these stone walls and two different types of structures. There were structures that were square and there were structures that were, uh, the foundations that remained were, were rounded. So according to the, the hosts and the archeologists that were tagging along, they had, they had some theories that maybe there was some Viking influence down here in this area. And so the two different types, uh, uh, I can't remember what the, the actual tribe that lived in this area was. They were Incan, but there was an actual name to the tribe. Um, they were doing the round shape. So if I if we show you some data here. Uh, 
So this was the mountain with the trees. They the 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 Incans were doing these round shaped foundations, and then the uh, Vikings supposedly were doing these more rectangular shaped. Um, and then they could see that the the whole structures that they were building in this area were, were changing more to a, a, a rectangular shape. Now this is all theoretical from these archaeologists, and I'm not an arch uh, an expert in the history in these areas. I'm just the guy that's sending somebody or going down to collect the data in these areas um, and then trying to process it and find it out, uh, help the archaeologists uh, prove his theory. So this was very interesting. So this is a big area. They scanned, uh, I don't know, 200 acres in a, in a flight with a lot of relief. And when we classified it with Globe Mapper, and a lot of times when you show just points to these guys or a point cloud, it's hard to to discern what exactly you're seeing. So uh, for them, so making an elevation model uh, and global mapper and showing them with the shading really helps a lot for these guys to visualize and to see these things that po uh, poke out in the, uh, the image. So just to show you here, you can see these round, bold shaped areas where they were these Incans. And then you see these uh, rectangular shaped structures as well. This was all covered by foliage. So if you use a camera, this stuff is invisible. And when you walk around in here, you can kind of tell about these round shaped structures, sort of, but you can't really tell the extent that they're there and that these different terracings are going on as well. Um, so this one uh, was a quite interesting project. Here's another site they did. We classified it and then we did all this over in the middle of the night. So they collected it just before dark. They had like power for two hours to, and, and just like satellite internet to send me the data. And uh, so I had really no idea what I was looking for other than they said round shaped structures and some rectangular shaped structures. Uh, I had to analyze it over the middle of the night and send it back to these guys for them to do their film shoot in the morning. And uh, this one really came out really nice with the different terracing and the, and the round shaped bowl structures. And then these rectangular structures that also appeared mixed in with these these round ones. Uh, if you watch the episode, so the episode aired, uh, they do a really nice job of highlighting the different areas and explaining it definitely a lot better than I am about the history of this site. Um, so the next one was also quite interesting. This one was very, very last minute. And I've always wanted to be to stone at uh, go see Stonehenge. We got contacted. I was out on a project and I got contacted uh, by a travel channel. It was Travel or Discovery. I can't remember which one it was. This this episode has not aired yet. But they're like, you want to do a, a show with uh, Megan Fox on Myths and Mysteries or Myths and Mysteries with Megan Fox. And uh, at the at that very moment, it didn't really click with me. They're really talking about Megan Fox from the Transformers. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, you know, Megan Fox, she's the one that was in the Transformers movie. It's like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll do that one. So uh, <laughs> I ended up... Uh, flying to like two days later flying to London and then taking a helicopter or a taxi to uh, about 45 minutes outside of London and then taking a helicopter and flying to Stonehenge. So uh, I ended up the the whole thing was I was supposed to be flying doing LIDAR in a helicopter with Megan Fox riding, around, riding along. Well when I get there she the, the what I learned about these shows is the higher the profile of the celebrity the more they throw fits and decide if they're going to be there or not be there. And I also learn that they can cut anybody into a scene, even if they never were even there and make it look like they were there. <laughs> so she ended up, I ended up doing all this. She never showed up because there were some military uh, activities going on at the same time in that area. And then the weather was also poor. We ended up flying over Stonehenge, which I'll show you some areas uh, that we scan here in just a second. And she never showed up. And we just, they basically are going to clip her into the show somehow. I'm not sure how. Well, I ended up griping because I didn't get to meet Megan Fox. So like two weeks later in the mail, I get a signed portrait from her <laughs> apologizing. <laughs> so uh, I guess it works out okay. I wish I could send a portrait of myself when somebody gets mad and to sign X's and O's, but it don't, don't work like that. Um. I got to meet like the head guy for Stonehenge. This guy right here is the archaeologist for Stonehenge. Uh, he's he also fits the look for TV because he looks like a leprechaun. I was giving him a hard time. I believe his name is Sid. 
it's been a little while since this was done about a year ago. Uh, this job we used uh, the mini bucks um, and we put it on this helicopter here. And my pilot, he looked all just like Tom Cruise. But uh, I gave him instructions on how to fly the project uh, and told him to fly. This scanner I told you was about, it's about a 300 meter scanner. And I said, stick around 250 meters or so. And uh, right over Stonehenge, he ended up flying about 500 meters. So the data over Stonehenge was very sparse and basically, in my opinion, not good enough to use for anything. But there was other sites around the area that they were looking for. Um, they were looking at doing, uh, like looking for the roadway, old ancient alien type stuff. Uh, I mean, it's all TV based stuff, but the archeologist was telling me that that's just a bunch of uh, myth, but um, that's what we were out there looking for, for these big old ancient roads or highways that left Stonehenge. Um, and maybe gave some kind of clue towards uh, alien type stuff. So here's a picture of the of the unit mounted on the helicopter, same one that goes on a drone. And then uh, we collected some of these interesting areas here that they probably will talk about in the shows of this big. Uh, and we're using Global Mapper to do this. This one was an easy one because there wasn't much vegetation, uh, but just a neat looking structure. Um, we colorized it using the world imagery out of Global Mapper. Just to show you that. And then the next one is actually Uxmal, the one that we were uh, talking about in this, uh, in the title of this presentation. So you can see Uxmal's over there on the, uh, down in the southwest corner by the Yucatan uh, of Mexico. Um, let's see. And they already have like a tourist attraction around this this mine ruin um you kind of see the layout here these pyramids are quite big they're all hand built of course um here's a picture of uh one of the pyramids that's been uncovered um you can see that the the drone over there on the right hand side uh just to kind of give you a uh some scale to this this project so this is one of the actual one of the smaller uh structures and at this site, they supposedly had like four different, five different types of uh, architecture. So they think that they were built over five different periods uh, or on top of each other, five different periods. Um, we used the uh, Quantergy scanner here, uh, the one with the uh, eight lasers. Um, and you can see, you can see off the left side is very dense um, uh, vegetation. And so this scanner here, we could fly by, we were, we were covering a really big area uh, as far as with a drone, about 500 acres in about an hour's time. Um, so, and it's very, very dense, not around this structure, but out over there to the left where you, in this image you'll see. So I'm going to show you just kind of the, the cool different pyramids and then how we rip away the trees to see other. Uh, so I, when I processed this, I also didn't attend this one, but when I, I was the processor again, uh, when I processed this one, I had no idea if there was anything that when you get to these sites, the archaeologists are like, hey, can you just they see how quickly we cover an area. Can you just fly over, you know, a mile that way and collect another three or four hundred acres? And you're uh, <laughs> they always like double and triple the size of the area when they see how rapidly we can connect, uh, collect this data. So we did. And I didn't he didn't give us any inclination of what we were going to expect to find in those areas. So I had to run the uh, uh, once I ran global mapper over this and rip away the trees and you start to see the the different uh, buildings that are out there. So I'm going to jump to the next slide here. So the big attraction of this one was the Pyramid of the Magician. It's about a 120 foot tall pyramid. Um, very cool looking pyramid. So when it, we collected imagery and LIDAR on this site, um, I'm going to go over that. So here we took the images. We used actually just a Mavic Pro 2, something we could travel with really easy uh, and flew it separate from the uh, LiDAR and collected the images. And we used the pixel to points tool uh, and global mapper to build the ortho image. So just rough positioning here, just using the, the lat longs from the GPS of the Mavic 2. So just several meter position uh, positioning images. Um, and then so it roughly puts it in place over the point cloud. So you can see we, we collected images. There was no point in us collecting all the imagery over the wooded areas because it's just green. There's nothing to see. 
so we just collected over the uh, areas where they actually had the Pyramid of the Magician and the cemetery and the uh, Nundry Quadrangle up there in the, in the north side. So we actually wanted that to fit right over the uh, the LIDAR, so we used the Geo Rectify tool or the Image Rectifier and measured points from the LIDAR and the ortho image to drape it over the LIDAR to make a colorized LIDAR. This is a tool that is very awesome to, uh, to have in your tool set. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize how easy it is to take your, your imagery and marry it over the LIDAR to make the product that much better. Um, Global Mapper makes that, that process really easy. Uh, this process can take uh, not not to make the ortho image, but to actually rectify it, it takes about 15 minutes to pick those points out. Um, so we're just like picking corner of buildings and uh, other features like that to marry the, the image to the LiDAR. And then it's a simple button click to drape that image over the LiDAR, make a, a colorized point cloud. So I'm just showing how we're, we're using the building corners here to uh, to move that image into the right spot. So it's already roughly there, but it's, only, it's several meters off. So here we go. Now we have an ortho image laid over in a colorized point cloud. Okay. And then, so you see in the middle there, that's the raw point cloud. On the left side is the classified, but on the right side is the colorized point cloud. So it gives you a much more visually ap appealing. Um, but on the left side, you can see when the trees were stripped away, some of the, and this is still a little bit less dense than the other areas of this project, but you can see how you start seeing uh, rectangular shaped man-made structures underneath the uh, trees there. Let's see what the next one. Got better slides that'll show that better. So here's just more, make a colorized point, nice colorized point cloud. Um, I believe this is, okay, so, you can see I have the elevation model that I developed in the site, and that's around the extremes of this image here. Uh, and then in the middle is where I haven't ripped away the trees yet. Um, I'm going to do that here. Well, I'll colorize it, and then I'm going to do the classification. So here's the classified of that area. And then here's the, a photo once those uh, uh, the trees are ripped away. And so you start seeing these man-made structures here. Now these, they all know about these. So there's, uh, these aren't, we're not making a new discovery or anything here uh, at this particular area, but the archeologists are wanting to test it out because there's so much undiscovered, unmapped areas down in the, in the uh, Mayan stuff. It's, it's just crazy. Uh, so here's just another cemetery group to show you. So with imagery, you can't see what's going on here. Uh, we rip away these trees here, and now you start seeing that the structure. And then this, uh, I thought it was anime. So this, I'll just flip back and forth between these two uh, slides here. You can see I have the, so this is the bigger area that I haven't shown yet, um, where you have the uh, elevation model, and then you have the, uh, uh, just the raw point cloud sitting on top of it, or the elevation, elevation model came from that. Just go back and forth. And you can see how now these structures are popping out. Oops. So again, at these sites, you only have like two or three hours to work with these guys. So you have to have a tool that can do it very quickly. So it's not going to be perfect. And and also the trick with these projects is that uh, you uh, where was I going? There's there. Oh, you want with you, when you classify, you want to you want normally when you classify, you want to rip away all the buildings and all the trees. Well, in this case, we kind of want the buildings to stick around. Uh, with some of these pyramids, it's much easier because they're big, flat objects. Uh, but so you have what we do we have to tweak the settings, and when we classify Global Mapper, and it's usually iterate a couple of times. So you need a tool that can classify very quickly. Um, so you want you don't want these foundation areas to disappear when you classify. So we're doing a little, we're kind of using the tool a little bit for what it's not meant to be used for, uh, but it works great. So, and then one of the biggest high, pro most high profile one we've done so far is the El Mirador Basin with the Snake Kings down with Expedition Unknown and Discovery Channel. So uh, National Geographic did this show uh, in 2014. They collected a big area and then, uh, 
some of the areas so they use a high altitude aerial scanner so they're just getting like two or three points a square meter now uh josh gates from expedition unknown he wanted to go down there and here's josh gates on the left and the archaeologists in the middle um and I, i'm on the right this was really rough and it this was like living underneath a bridge uh they cut the they cut the power on just for us because we're out there with all the camera crew and they have to charge the batteries and we got to analyze data but most of the time they only have the generator running very limited time out there in the jungle uh no air conditioning we're living underneath the tent uh with uh we're living in a tent with a, a pla black plastic over the top of us and you better hope it rains because that's the only place you're getting water out there so you have your black plastic shape so that it catches water into a five gallon bucket when it rains and it actually rains quite often um i'll, I'll show you a couple pictures of how, when we're flying the drone there's rainstorms all around us um here's a picture of us getting ready to do the final analysis on the tv show josh gates sitting there with his uh archaeological hat trying to look like he does well he does he does a lot of archaeology but trying to fit the role of course and then the camera crew around the uh, outside there so this was actually a very nice building. Everything you see in this picture came out there by helicopter. The only way to get out there is by helicopter. Uh, the only opening in the jungle is the helicopter and the top of the pyramid. Uh, so the world's largest pyramid is down there by volume. It's huge. It's so big, you think it's a mountain when you're standing by it. And it's covered underneath about 20, 30 feet of dirt. So here's a picture of the area that I got to stay in for a week. Uh, and then that's my shower over there on the right side. And my toilet is that bench back there behind it. That's, and then inside the tent, all you have is a foam pad to sleep on and a sheet. And then hopefully a Jaguar or a boa constrictor doesn't try to meet you in the tent. Uh, the howler monkeys hang out just above your tent and scream all night long. Didn't know what one of, one of those were until I was there. It sounds like King Kong is walking through the woods. Um, at this, this site because it's so rough i didn't want to take one of the really high-end scanners we took uh one of the, the veldine 32 something that could really penetrate this this vegetation the trees there are about 50 feet tall um they wanted me to fly the drone out like six miles away but as soon as it goes like 200 mi uh, yards away from the uh the helicopter pad i can't see it anymore because i'm surrounded by trees so i told them that was out of the question because i wanted to maintain somewhat line of sight with the drone so the next best thing was to call the helicopter pilot back in and uh, mount this thing on a helicopter. So we had to use what resources we had, which was duct tape, zip ties, and a little bit of rope. And a, they had a steel bar out there from one of the buildings that they tore down, and we mounted it to the helicopter. In the States, this wouldn't fly, but in Guatemala, and nobody's there to, to enforce anything, this worked great. <laughs> Uh, here's just a picture we're at the second or the third tier of of the pyramid the main archaeologist with his back to us right there in the center uh, and standing next to Josh Gates they're doing they're getting ready to do a film shoot here that's Richard Hansen he uh, was actually the main archaeologist that consulted for the television or the TV movie or the movie uh, Apocalypto uh, here I am standing at the bottom of the top tier of the pyramid and they actually have the top tier excavated so we they wanted to fly and scan this because Nat Geo didn't cover this area very uh, to enough detail to see what the actual pyramid looked like so uh, we flew the top of this pyramid and so this is what the jungle or the, the forest down there looks like Amazon forest uh, part of it and you can see there's a uh, there's usually rainstorms that pass over about every two hours uh, and they're pretty heavy for about 15 minutes and then they disappear. So there's like three storms around us when we're getting ready to fly this drone. And uh, you can see if you're trying to use imagery, you would not you wouldn't pick up anything. You don't know if it's a mountain or a hill or a, uh, there's not really mountains here, more like hills, but you don't know if it's a pyramid or uh, some other kind of structure. So here we are, we scanned uh, Ladanta is the name of the world's largest pyramid. This is the top two tiers right here. That top tier in the center is about a hundred and so feet tall. Uh, each each tier, it, you know, gets bigger and bigger. It's big, like a normal pyramid. I think the base of the pyramid was over 800 meters uh, wide. 
um, just a massive pyramid. It, it's so big, you don't even feel like you're on a pyramid. And the thing is, it's covered underneath 15 to 20 feet of dirt. They haven't excavated with just the top tier because it has to be all done by hand. They don't have any uh, machinery to, to move the dirt away. Um, so let me just run that one more time. So you can see how we strip those trees away. So it's pretty much invisible until you do the classification and make an elevation model. So you have the main tier here, and then on the two sides, you have these small, smaller tiers. The way the Mayans did it is they actually built little wood structures on these pyramids. And the more higher up in, uh, I guess, like if you're upper class, then you were higher up on the pyramid. And then the lower class member further down. Um, so here's uh, just another elevation model generated by a uh, global mapper and auto classification tool. This one, we had very little time to analyze. Uh, these guys are way, uh, they want everything done immediately. Even if we've done a couple shows with them, they still want it done in like 30 minutes time. So you need a, a program or a software tool that can do that very quickly. And just another shot of the top tier here. And then my final slide is to show you what it looks like. Just a neat little shot of the final elevation model of that of that tier there so you can see the different terracing and things like that um that's all i have and uh thank you very much if there's any questions that, that was fascinating daniel uh, you had all of us here uh, back in uh, blue marble headquarters on the edge of our seats um yes questions that we i know we're almost out of time here so we'll, we'll run through just a few of those and again if we need to follow up with you directly we will do that um First question came in pretty much right as you started uh, when you were looking at the site where you were looking for the treasure. By the way, you did find some treasure, I hope. And I know we're going to get our cut here. I think we're entitled to <laughs> get some of that treasure shipped to Maine for us. Um, someone was asking about the resolution of that data. I think you mentioned the size of the point cloud itself. Uh, do you have any information about the density of the, that point cloud? So with that point cloud, it was probably around 50 to 100 points a square meter. It all depends on how fast I fly. Uh, I, actual points on the ground, it might be a little bit less than that because a lot of it's hitting the trees, but that one with the multiple returns and things, it's probably averaging about, I would say about 50 points a square meter. Okay. So I covered, um, I covered that going about 15 miles an hour and flew about 100 meters high, something like that. Okay, great, great. Um, a couple of questions about the, the actual TV shows themselves. Someone, someone had asked what the TV shows were. I think that was information that was in some of the successive slides. So um, hopefully, again, we'll, we'll have the video of this. So if you want to backfill and get some information about what shows. Someone was asking very specifically if the, these shows are available on a platform like YouTube. Do you know if, if that is the case, yeah. Danielle? Some of, them are, some of them are on YouTube. Some of them are available like on the History Channel website. Uh, most of them are, you have to go to the actual website to see. I think on LighterUSA.com we've put links if they have them there. Okay. Some of them haven't aired. Some of them haven't even aired yet. They sometimes take a long time to air. Yeah, um, we'll we'll put uh, uh, the uh, links on, on a follow-up email as well. So if we can get to uh, and some, a lot of people are asking about having, uh, looking at the TV shows themselves. Uh, there were some questions about Megan Fox. We'll not ask those. <laughs> we'll keep those on, uh, under our hat. Um, more technical question in regards to the fact that you do seemingly fly to multiple locations. And I think may, this may have been the same person asked the question earlier from one of our previous presenters, just in terms of the regulations required. I know we're very familiar here in the U.S. about FAA regulations in terms of flying. And I know you're a licensed UAV pilot. Uh, how do you deal with the logistical considerations when you go overseas was the question. So usually, uh, like down in Guatemala, there's not, well, at least at this time, there really wasn't that much to worry about. Uh, I usually have the channel, like the History Channel, or Trip Discovery, Travel. They all take care of that and make sure we're flying legally and all that. And they usually have, if, if it's required to have a pilot in that area from that uh, country, then they, they take care of that part. It's tricky sometimes to get the drones in and out of the country. So I actually travel with the drone and the drone has to be registered, you know, or deregistered from U.S. to whatever country you're going to. So those every country is different. And I usually let the channel channels figure that part out uh, so I don't have to worry about it too much. That's good to have them helping you. Uh, one final question for you, Daniel. Uh, someone is asking very specifically about recommendation for hardware, going back probably to your introductory slides, specifically in the context of maybe some archaeological work. Somebody's getting started with this. Can you give us a ballpark as to what they would need to get up and running, maybe even a, you know, what sort of price point are we looking at to get the necessary hardware? Yeah. Uh, 
the multi-channel scanners are the most popular with the archaeologists because I mean with the multiple returns you get down on the ground with the single line scanners but the uh, having the multiple scan lines really helps better actually because we have a lot of people that are using both and if they have to penetrate through the vegetation the classification tools and things work a lot better of course if you get more points down on the ground uh, and you don't have these empty void spots uh, the best scanners to pick would be like the multi-line. They're less accurate than the single line, uh, but for these archaeology type projects, uh, you know, three centimeters usually better than what they're even working with uh, when they're when they're mapping, trying to use GPS underneath tree canopy. So uh, the ballpark ranges between like 40 to 60k, just depending for the for the lighter unit. Okay, so and obviously they can contact you directly if uh, if they have more detailed yeah. questions or want to follow up with that one. Well, great. Well, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time. This this was genuinely a, a pleasure. I, I it was fascinating. We're literally sitting on the edge of our seats here. So thank you very much for sharing, and hey, good luck with uh, all of your future endeavors. Thank you.